Mary Yellen sat huddled in her corner, swaying from side to side, shaken by the coach, and it seemed to her that never before had she known there was malevolence in solitude. On either side of the road there were no trees, no lanes, but mile upon mile of bleak moorland. Already, though barely forty miles by road from Helford, her home for twenty-three years, the hope within her heart had tired. That rather gallant courage, which was so large a part of her, was now shaken by this alien, barren landscape. No human being could live in this wasted country, thought Mary, and remain like other people. They would have something of the devil left in them still. She lifted the window sash and looked out. She saw ahead of her, on the crest of a hill, tall chimneys, murky dim in the darkness. If this was Jamaica Inn, it stood alone in glory, four square to the winds. The horses were pulled to a standstill. The driver climbed down from his seat, carrying Mary's box down with him. Then the coach was away, disappearing as though it had never been. Mary stood alone, with the trunk at her feet. She heard a sound of bolts being drawn in the dark house behind her, and the door was flung open. A great figure strode into the yard, swinging a lantern from side to side. The light shone in her eyes, and she could see nothing. Oh, it's you, is it? I'm your uncle, Joss Merlin. I bid you welcome to Jamaica Inn. He drew her into the shelter of the house, stood the lantern upon a table in the passage, and they looked upon each other, face to face. He was a great husk of a man, nearly seven feet high, with a creased black brow, a mat of hair, and a skin the colour of a gypsy. His mouth might have been perfect once, but was now sunken and fallen, and there was still something fine about his great dark eyes, in spite of the lines and pouches and the red blood flecks. So you are Mary Yellen. You've come all this way to look after your Uncle Joss. Ah, I call it very handsome of you. He laughed, mocking her, his laugh bellowing through the house, acting like a lash on Mary's strung nerves. Where is my Aunt Patience? she asked, glancing around her in the dimly lit passage. Where's my Aunt Patience? mimicked the man. And you a kiss for your Uncle Joss first? Mary drew back. The thought of kissing him revolted her. He was either mad or drunk, probably both. I'm not going to touch you. I never did like dark women. Then he shouted. Down the narrow stairs came a woman, wearing a dingy mob cap on her thin grey hair. Mary stared at her. Was this poor, tattered creature the bewitching Aunt Patience of her dreams, who was always laughing and wore ribbons in her bonnet and a silk petticoat? She was dressed now like a slattern and looked twenty years older. Aunt Patience made a tremendous effort and smiled and led the way through a murky passage into the kitchen. You mustn't mind your Uncle Joss, she said, her manner changing suddenly, like a whimpering dog that has been trained by constant cruelty to implicit obedience, and who, in spite of kicks and curses, will fight like a tiger for its master. You'll soon come to like him. He's a fine man. There's no one will say a word against him, and it's not always as quiet as this here. It's a busy highway, and coaches pass every day. Mary murmured some reply but she was pained and worried to see how her aunt avoided her eyes. Joss Merlin came in and fell to drinking brandy, staring moodily before him. Mary was not too tired to watch her uncle, for already she had caught something of Aunt Patience's nervousness, 
and it was as if they were like mice in a trap, with him playing with them like a monstrous cat. Suddenly he thumped the table with his fist, shaking the plates and cups. I'm master in this house, Mary Ellen, and I'll have you know it. You'll do as you're told and help in the house and serve my customers, and I'll not lay a finger on you. But if you open your mouth, I'll break you until you eat out of my hand, the same as your aunt. Mary faced him across the table. She held her hands in her lap so that he should not see them tremble. I understand you. I've never gossiped in my life. I do my work about the house, and you'll have no cause to grumble. But if you hurt Aunt Patience in any way, I'll leave Jamaica in and have the law on you. Then try and break me if you like. Mary had turned very pale. She knew that if he thundered at her now, she would break down and cry. Had she but known it, she had saved herself, for her little show of spirit impressed the man, and he leant back in his chair and relaxed. You and I are more akin than I thought, Mary Yellen. I might have work for you at Jamaica Inn one day. Man's work, where you play with life and death. Aunt Patience gave a little gasp beside her. The agony in her eyes frightened Mary more than anything that had happened that night. What had roused Aunt Patience to such panic? What had Joss Merlin been about to say? Her uncle pushed the empty brandy glass away from him and folded his arms on the table. There's been one weakness in my life. is drink. It's a curse and I know it. And I talk until every damn thing I've ever done is spilt to the four winds. Your aunt locks me in my room and I shout my secrets into my pillow. I've told you, because I'm already a little drunk and can't hold my tongue. But I'm not drunk enough to tell you why I live in this God-forgotten spot. This drink, that's the curse of all of us, Mary. There's never been a Merlin yet that died peacefully in his bed. My father was hanged at Exeter. My brother, Matthew, was drowned in Trewother Marsh. And the youngest, Jem, he'll be caught in time and hanged too, like his father. Then he fell silent. He'd said enough. Mary's room was above the porch. The walls were rough and unpapered, the floorboards bare. For a long while she sat huddled on the bed, a prey to despair. She felt caught here, like a bird in a net. If she stayed even one night beneath this roof, her nerve would go, and she would be lost. Lost, and mad, and broken, like Aunt Patience. She tiptoed to the head of the stairs when she heard a sound from the other passage. It was her aunt, crying. Mary waited a moment, and then went back to her own room. Whatever she would have to face in the future, and however frightened she would be, she would not leave Jamaica in now. She was needed here. She must stay with Aunt Patience. Mary's mother would not have run away because of a half-crazy man. She would have the courage to fight her enemies and conquer them. The next morning, Joss was not at home. Where he had gone and on what business, Mary neither asked nor cared. She was only too relieved to be rid of him. During the morning, there was the usual work of the house, and Mary was able to explore the inn more thoroughly. It was a dark, rambling place with long passages and unexpected rooms. There was a separate entrance to the bar, and, though the room was empty now, there was a lingering taste of old tobacco, the sour smell of drink, and an impression of warm, unclean humanity. For all the unpleasant suggestion that it conjured, it was the one room in the inn that had vitality. The other rooms appeared neglected or unused. Even the parlour had a solitary air, as though it were many months since an honest traveller had stepped upon the threshold. Beneath her room, down a passage, was a locked room. Mary went out into the yard to look at it through the window, but there was a board nailed up against the frame and she could not see inside. She then went out onto the road. 
and as far as her eyes could see, there was nothing but the black hills and the moors. To the west of Jamaica Inn, high tors reared their heads. Some were smooth like downland, but others were sinister and austere, their peaks crowned with granite and great slabs of stone. She went back into the house, her appetite sharp for the dinner. She fell to with a will upon stewed mutton and turnips. Her hunger appeased for the first time in four and twenty hours, she felt her courage return, and she was ready to question her aunt and risk the consequences. Aunt Patience, why is my uncle a landlord of Jamaica Inn? The sudden direct attack took the woman by surprise, and for a moment she stared at Mary without reply. And why don't travellers stop here? Twisting her fingers in her lap, her aunt explained that Uncle Joss didn't encourage folk to stay. In this lonely spot, they could be murdered in their beds. But what is the use of an inn that cannot give an honest traveller a bed for the night? And how do you live if you have no custom? The driver on the coach had told Mary that respectable people were afraid and did not come to Jamaica any more. Her aunt was silent. Mary saw she had suffered enough but with a rather cruel audacity of youth, she ventured one question more. Aunt Patience, I want you to look at me and answer me this, and then I won't worry you again. What has the barred room at the end of the passage to do with the wheels that stop outside Jamaica Inn by night? As soon as she had spoken, she was sorry, and she yearned for the words to be unsaid. It was too late, though, the damage had been done. A strange expression crept upon the woman's face, and her great hollow eyes stared across the table in terror. Her mouth trembled, and she looked fearful, haunted. Mary pushed back her chair. She knelt by her side and put her arms around her and kissed her. Aunt Patience took Mary's hands in hers and gazed into her face. Mary! I must give you a word of warning. There were things that happened at Jamaica Inn that she'd never dared to breathe. Bad things. Evil things. Patience couldn't even admit them to herself. Some of it in time Mary would come to know. She couldn't avoid it, living there. Uncle Joss mixed with strange men who followed a strange trade. From her window above the porch, Mary would hear footsteps and voices. When they came, Mary was to say nothing. She must lie in bed and put her fingers in her ears. She was never to question anyone, for if she came to guess what went on, her hair would go grey and she would weep by night, and all that lovely, careless youth would die as patiences had died. Mary sat on the floor and saw through the kitchen window that the sun had already disappeared behind the furthest hill and that before many hours had passed, the grey malevolence of a November dusk would have fallen upon Jamaica once again. Joss Merlin was away from home for nearly a week, and during that time, Mary came to know something of the country. The moors were even wilder than she had at first supposed. It was a silent, desolate country. On the high tors, the slabs of stone leant against one another in strange shapes and forms, massive sentinels who had stood there since the hands of God first fashioned them. Towards the end of the week, as she crossed the yard, she noticed with sinking heart that the stable door was open the pony inside. Her uncle had returned. He was, it seemed, in high good humour. Well, he roared, aren't you pleased to see me? You miss me much? Mary made an effort to smile, and as she turned to go upstairs to her room, Joss called to tell her that it was Saturday night, and there would be company at Jamaica Inn. They came singly and furtively, the people of the moors, 
crossing the yard swiftly and silently, as though they had no wish to be seen. They seemed no more than shadows as they skirted the wall and passed under the shelter of the porch to knock upon the door of the bar and gain admittance. The light streamed from the windows, usually so shuttered and barred, and as the hours went by, the sound of voices rose upon the air. There was shouting, singing, ribald songs led in the main part by Harry the peddler, showing that those visitors had lost their fear when under cover of the house. Securely separated by the counter and half screened by a barrier of bottles and glasses, Mary could look down upon the company and remain unobserved. The men were dirty for the most part tramps, vagrants, poachers, thieves, cattle stealers, and gypsies. The evening seemed interminable. The air was so thick with smoke that it was hard to see across the room. And to Mary's weary, half closed eyes, the faces of the men loomed shapeless and distorted. When she could bear it no longer, she touched her uncle on the shoulder, and he turned to her, his face blotched with the heat of the room and streaming with perspiration. She was surprised to see that although he had been drinking, he was sober. Think yourself a little bit too good for us? He pinched her cheek between his finger and thumb, hurting her. It was close on midnight, and he told her to lock her door and pull down the blind. He lowered his voice and seized her wrist, doubling it behind her back until she cried out in pain. You're not a fool like your aunt. You've got a clever little monkey mind, and you're not easily scared. I tell you this, Mary Ellen. It doesn't do to be curious at Jamaica Inn. I have you remember that. I'll break that mind of yours if you let it go astray, and I'll break your body too. He turned away from her, but the contempt in her eyes must have irritated him, for his good humour had left him in a flash. Mary did as her uncle had told her. She pulled the blanket over her head, her only thought to be deaf to the horror and the revelry below. She slept. Then, she heard a heavy, dragging sound, and she was awake suddenly. Something was being taken along the passage to the room at the end, the room with the barred windows and the bolted door. She got out of bed and went to the window, pulling aside an inch of blind. She saw five wagons lined up in the yard outside. Gathered round them were some of the men who had been drinking in the bar earlier in the evening. They worked quickly against time. Those men who had shouted and sung earlier that night were now sober and silent, bent on the business in hand. As soon as the wagons were unloaded, they passed out into the night as swiftly and as silently as they had come. Then there was no one left in the yard but a man Mary had not seen before, Harry the peddler, and her uncle. The clock in the hall rang the hour, three o'clock. She heard them go along the passage in the direction of the bar. Their footsteps died away, and a door slammed. Mary was too wide awake. What she had witnessed was smuggling on the grand scale. There was no doubt that Jamaica Inn was ideally situated for this purpose, and Mary could see that it must be easy enough for anyone with a capacity for organisation. To work a team of wagons from the coast, with the inn itself as halting place and general store. And yet, had Jos Merlin the necessary brain and subtlety to lead such an enterprise? Did he plan every move and every departure? And had he been making preparations for tonight's work during the past week, when away from home? It must be so. Mary could see no alternative. If it were not for Aunt Patience, she would walk out of the inn now, find her way to the nearest town, and inform against Jos Merlin. Smuggling was dangerous; it was forbidden strictly by the law of the land. But had she seen only part of the game? Was there still more for her to learn? She remembered the terror in Aunt Patience's eyes, and those words spoken in the hush of that first afternoon. There's things happen at Jamaica Inn. 
bad things, evil things. I dare not even admit them to myself. Then Mary swore, a thing she had only done once before in her life, to give herself courage and a certain bold pretense. I not show fear before Joss Merlin or any man, she said to herself as she dressed hurriedly, pulled on her stockings and crept into the passage. The hall was as black as a pit, and although she knew she stood alone there, the very solitude was threatening. As she hesitated, gathering courage to continue, a sudden beam of light shone into the passage, and she heard the murmur of voices. Mary was tempted to climb back up the stairs and seek safety in sleep, but there was a demon of curiosity within her, and so she crouched against the wall. Her hands and forehead were wet with perspiration, and she could hear nothing but the loud beating of her heart. The door was open, but she could not see or hear the men. Then suddenly a man's voice rang out, quavering and high, the voice of a stranger. I tell you for the final time, I'll not be a party to it. That's murder you'd have me do, Mr Merlin. There's no other name for it. It's common murder. Someone replied in a low tone, and Mary could not catch his words. His speech was broken by a cackle of coarse laughter that she recognised as belonging to the peddler. He must have hinted a question, for the stranger spoke again swiftly in self-defence. Swing in, is it? I'm not afraid of my neck. No, I'm thinking of my conscience and of Almighty God. I'll face any man in a fair fight, but when it comes to the killing of innocent folk, women and children, that's going straight to hell, Joss Merlin, and you know it as well as I do. Someone thumped his fist on the table and swore, and her uncle lifted his voice for the first time. You're soaked in this business up to your neck and be damned to your blasted conscience. I told you there's no going back on it now. It's too late for you and for all of us. I've been doubtful of you from the first with your gentleman's airs and your clean cuffs. And by God, I proved myself right. Harry, bolt the door. There was a sudden scuffle and a cry. Once more, the peddler laughed, odious and obscene and he began to whistle. Now look here, Mr. Lawyer Clark, or whatever you are, Joss continued. You've made a fool of yourself tonight, but you're not going to make a fool of me. You'd like to walk out of that door and be away to Bodmin, and by nine in the morning you'd have every magistrate in the country that Jamaica in. That's your fine idea, isn't it? Mary could hear the stranger breathe heavily, as if in pain. Do your devil's work if you must. I give you my word I'll not inform against you, but join you I will not. And there's my last word to you both. There was a silence, and then Joss Merlin spoke again. Have a care. I heard another man say that once, and five minutes later he was treading the air on the end of a rope. Outside in the passage, Mary felt her neck and her forehead go clammy with sweat, and she realised that she was going to faint. Her uncle's voice came from very far away. Leave me alone with him, Mary. There'll be no more work for you tonight. Take his horse and cast him loose the other side of Camelford. I'll settle this business by myself. Somehow Mary found her way to the parlour and crumpled in a heap on the floor. She must have fainted, but in a moment she came to and wondered whether it would be possible for her to go and get help. Mary was about to step out into the hall when a sound from above made her pause. It was the creaking of a board. There was silence for a minute, and then it happened again. Quiet footsteps pacing gently overhead. Aunt Patience slept at the other end of the house. Someone was in the empty guest room on the floor above. Whoever was in hiding must have heard her every movement. Therefore he must wish to remain concealed. He must have hidden there so that he should remain unseen by the smugglers. Someone, an ally perhaps, could help her save the stranger in the bar. She was about to mount the stairs when the beam of light shone forth once more from the back passage. The landlord climbed the stairs to the landing above. 
his footsteps came to a halt outside the guest room, and for a second or two he waited, as though he too listened for some alien sound. Then he tapped twice, very softly on the door. Mary's heart sank within her, and her first despair returned. This could be no enemy to her uncle after all. He had known him to be there all the time. She thanked God then that she had not climbed the stairs and knocked on the door. They came down the stairs together and stopped outside the parlour door, so close that she could have touched her uncle through the crack of the door. As it was, his voice whispered against her ear. As for you to say, it's your judgment now, not mine. I'll do it, or we'll do it between us. As for you to say the word. Then they turned back along the hall and down to the bar beyond. She must have stood for ten minutes or more waiting for some sound or signal, but everything was still. Once she fancied she heard a cry, but it was gone and lost in an instant. Then Mary went out into the hall. No crack of light came under the door to the bar. There was not even the murmur of a voice. Mary lifted the latch and stepped into the room. The door leading to the yard was open, and the room was filled with the fresh November air. The men had gone. A last little ray of moonlight made a white circle on the floor, and into the circle moved a dark blob like a finger. It was the reflection of a shadow. Mary looked up to the ceiling and saw that a rope had been slung through a hook in the beam. It was the rope's end that made the blob in the white circle, and it kept moving backwards and forwards, blown by the draught from the open door. Mary had just started to clean the stone flags of the entrance hall when she heard a clatter of hooves in the yard and someone thundered on the closed door of the bar. No one had approached Jamaica Inn before. This summons was an event in itself. The door must have been unlocked, for to her surprise there was a man sitting straddle-legged across a chair with a glass in his hand filled to the brim with ale which he had calmly poured out from the tap himself. For a few minutes they considered one another in silence. Something about him was familiar, and Mary wondered where she had seen him before. The sight of him looking her up and down and drinking his ale at the same time irritated her beyond measure. What do you think you're doing? The landlord didn't encourage strangers. The man finished his ale and held out the glass to be refilled. Since when have they kept a barmaid at Jamaica Inn? He asked her, lighting his pipe and puffing a great cloud of smoke into her face. His manner infuriated Mary, and she leant forward and pulled the pipe out of his hand, throwing it behind her onto the floor, where it smashed at once. Is this how they train you to serve customers? There are better mannered maids in Launceston and pretty as paint into the bargain. What have you been doing with yourself? Your hair is coming down at the back and your face is none too clean. Mary turned away and into the kitchen, straight into the arms of the landlord himself. Who in hell's name were you talking to? I warned you to keep your mouth shut. His voice echoed in the passage. All right, called the man from the bar. Don't beat her. She's broken my pipe and refused to serve me. Come in. Let's have a look at you. I'm hoping this maid has done you some good. Joss Merlin frowned, and pushing Mary aside, he stepped into the bar. Ah, oh, it's you, Jem, is it? What do you want? Mary went back to her bucket of water in the front hall, wiping the dirty mark from her face with her apron. So that was Jem Merlin, her uncle's younger brother. Of course, she had seen the resemblance all the time and, like a fool, had not been able to place it. 
He was what Joss Merlin might have been 18, 20 years ago, but smaller in build and height, neater in person. Mary was so absorbed in her work that it was not until a shower of pebbles made a crack in the glass that her concentration was disturbed, and she saw Jem standing in the yard beside his pony. What do you want now? she asked, conscious suddenly of her loose hair and rumpled dirty apron. He looked at her with curiosity, but the insolence had gone, and he had the grace to appear the smallest bit ashamed of himself. Forgive me if I was rude just now. Somehow I didn't expect to see a young girl like you at Jamaica Inn. I thought Joss had found you in one of the towns and brought you back here for his fancy lady. Mary flushed. There's nothing very fanciful about me, she said scornfully. I'd look well in a town, wouldn't I? My old apron and heavy shoes. Oh, I don't know. Put you in a fine gown and a pair of high-heeled shoes and stick a comb in your hair. I dare say you'd pass for a lady even in a big place like Exeter. He looked serious, and his likeness to Joss had fled for the moment. She wished he were not a Merlin. When he inquired why she had come to Jamaica Inn, she explained how her mother had died some weeks ago, and she had no other relative other than Aunt Patience. I'll tell you one thing, Mr Merlin. Meeting your brother was the worst day in her life. Jem patted his horse's neck. Merlins have never been good to our women. I can remember my father beating my mother till she couldn't stand. She never left him, though. Stood by him all his life. Mary was silent. He spoke entirely without shame or regret, and she supposed that he had been born, like the rest of his family, lacking the quality of tenderness. "'What do you do for a livelihood?' asked Mary, in sudden curiosity, for during their conversation she became aware that he spoke better than his brother. Jem bent down to brush a piece of dirt from his pony's shoe. "'I'm a horse thief!' Mary laughed in spite of herself. He was so frank in his dishonesty that she had not the heart to be angry with him. Jem Merlin looked at her gravely, and then, on a sudden impulse, he bent towards her. Jamaica Inn is no place for a maid. Why don't you run away? I'd see you on the road to Bodmin all right. I'm serious now. His tones were persuasive, and Mary could almost have trusted him. I don't need any help. I can look after myself. Jem threw his leg over the pony's back and stuck his feet into the leathers. Mary went slowly back into the house. She was in urgent need of a friend. Because he had a disarming smile, she had been ready to believe in him. But he was Joss Merlin's brother. Whatever happened, she must stand alone in this business and trust no one. That night... The wagons came again. There were only two carts this time and less than half a dozen men standing in the yard. The wagons had arrived empty and were loaded with the remainder of the cargo deposited at the inn the time before. It was with a sudden sting of disappointment that Mary wondered whether Jem Merlin's visit to Jamaica in this morning had significance. He could have ridden to Jamaica to warn the landlord that he might expect the convoy in the evening. Mary was angry with him and with herself. In spite of everything, her last thought before sleeping had been the possibility of his friendship. She would be a fool if she had hopes of it now. The next few days passed without incident. Her uncle had ridden away on the moor somewhere, and a sense of freedom possessed her. She sang as she washed and wrung out her linen and spread it on the stunted gorse bush. With the full force of the sun, it would be dry by noon. An urgent tapping on the window made her look up, and she saw Aunt Patience beckon to her, very white in the face and evidently frightened. Mary ran to the back door of the house. No sooner had she entered the kitchen than her aunt seized upon her with trembling hands. It's Squire Bassett. 
He's never been before. He's heard something. Oh, Mary, what are we going to do? Even as she spoke, there was a loud knock at the entrance door and then a pause, followed by a thunder of blows. Mary thought quickly. She was in a difficult position. If this was Squire Bassett and he represented the law, it was her one chance of betraying her uncle. She could tell him of the wagons and all she had seen since her arrival. Mary, if Mr Bassett asks you what you know, you won't answer him, will you? If any danger came to Joss, I'd kill myself. There was no argument after that. Mary would lie herself into hell rather than let her aunt suffer. There were two men outside the porch. Aunt Patience made a little curtsy. My husband went out after breakfast, Mr Bassett, she said, speaking unnaturally loudly and clearly. And whether he'll be back before nightfall, I really cannot say. Hmm. I wanted a word or two with Mr Joss Merlin. Your precious husband may have bought Jamaica in behind my back, but one thing I won't stand for, and that's having all my land hereabouts a byword for everything that's damnable and dishonest. Go on, Mrs Merlin. Lead the way upstairs. I'm a magistrate and I've got a warrant. The rooms on the landing were thoroughly explored. The squire peered into the dusty corners, lifted the old sacks and prodded the potatoes, all the while uttering exclamations of anger and disgust. When there was nothing more to see, he asked to see the locked room with the barred windows. Since Aunt Patience was incapable of speech, Mary spoke. I'm afraid the door is locked. My uncle always keeps the key and where he puts it, I don't know. The squire looked from one to the other in suspicion and went out into the yard to call his servant. Then Mary watched Mr Bassett and his servant ram a bar against the lock of the door until there was a splitting of wood and the door gave way before them. Except for a pile of sacks in one corner, the room was completely empty. On the top of the sacks lay a length of twisted rope. Turning to Mary, the squire asked her if she knew anything of her uncle's business or if anybody called there by day or by night. Mary looked him straight in the eyes. I've never seen anyone. And didn't she think it very peculiar to keep an inn on the king's highway and then bolt and bar the house to every passerby? My uncle is a very peculiar man. He is indeed. In fact, he's so peculiar that half the people in the countryside won't sleep easy in their beds until he's been hanged, like his father before him. And you can tell him that from me. Then he climbed onto his horse, gathering the reins in his hands. One other thing. Have you seen anything of your uncle's younger brother, Jem Merlin of Trewartha, over near Kilmar? No. He never comes here. Aunt Patience had already preceded Mary to the kitchen and was sitting on a chair in a state of collapse. Mary poured herself out a tumbler of water and drank it in one breath. She was in a fair way to losing her temper. She had lied to save her uncle's skin when every inch of her longed to proclaim his guilt. Well, she was committed now and there was no going back. For better, for worse, she had become one of the company at Jamaica Inn. Not only had she lied to save her uncle, she had lied to help his brother Jem. Why? She did not know. Joss Merlin returned just before noon and was met with a babble of words from his wife. After a while, he beckoned Mary from the window. He was standing on the hearth, his legs straddled wide, and his face as black as thunder. What in hell's been going on here? Mary told him calmly. She omitted nothing, except the squire's question about his brother, and ended with Mr Bassett's own words, that people would not sleep easy in their beds until Joss Merlin was hanged, like his father before him. The landlord listened in silence, and when she had finished, he crashed his fist down on the kitchen table. The damned skulking bastard! He'd no right to walk into my house! By 
God, if I'd been here, I'd have sent him back to North Hill so as his own wife would never recognise him. Damn and blast his eyes! Mary did not fear him like this. It was when he lowered his voice and whispered that she knew him to be deadly. For all his thunder, he was frightened. She could see that, and his confidence was rudely shaken. You've done well today, Mary, and I'll not forget it. His niece looked him in the eyes. You don't think I did it for you, do you? As soon as her uncle had finished lunch, Mary watched him strike out across the moor. For a moment she hesitated and then went after him. Her idea was to keep Joss Merlin in view while remaining unseen, and in this way, perhaps, she would learn something of his secret mission. She had no doubt that Squire Bassett's visit to Jamaica Inn had altered the landlord's plans, and that this sudden departure on foot across the heart of the West Moor was connected with it. Her task was a difficult one. The landlord walked at such a pace and took such tremendous strides that before long Mary saw she would be left behind. She followed as best she could the tracks taken by her uncle, but the ground turned soggy beneath her feet, for the early frost had thawed and turned to water. The damp oozed into her shoes, and the hem of her skirt was bespattered with bog and torn in places. Mary plunged on, but her uncle had already crossed the worst of the low ground with uncanny quickness, and she could just make out his figure amongst the black heather. Then he was hidden by a jutting crag of granite, and she saw him no more. It was very silent on the hills. Joss Merlin had long vanished. Mary would never find him now. She knew herself for a fool to have ventured so far on a December afternoon, for experience had proved to her that when darkness came, it was swift and sudden. Whatever happened, she must keep her head and not give way to her growing sense of panic. There was no danger from the marshes if she kept to the high ground, so, trussing up her skirt and wrapping her shawl firmly round her shoulders, Mary walked steadily onwards. After what seemed an interminable distance, she came to a rough track bearing ahead and slightly to the right. The worst was past, and now that her real anxiety had gone, she felt weak and desperately tired. She plodded on, thinking that for the first time the tall, grey chimneys of Jamaica Inn would be a welcome and consoling sight. Then she heard the sound of a horse coming out of the darkness to the left of her, Mary waited in the middle of the track, and presently the horse appeared out of the mist, a rider on his back, the pair of ghostly figures lacking reality in the dim light. The horseman swerved as he saw Mary and pulled up his horse to avoid her. He peered down at her from his saddle and exclaimed in surprise, A woman? What in the world are you doing out here? Mary seized hold of his rein and quietened the restive horse. Can you put me on the road? I'm hopelessly lost. I live at Jamaica Inn. No sooner were the words out of her mouth than she regretted them. The very name, Jamaica Inn, was enough for him to leave her to find her own way home. For a moment the man was silent, but when he spoke his voice was low and gentle, and Mary could see he must be a person of quality. You've come a long way out of your road. You must have been walking in the opposite direction. He considered her for a moment, and then he swung himself off the saddle to the ground. You're exhausted. We are not far from the village, but you aren't fit to walk another step. In a minute she was up in the saddle, and he stood below her, the bridle in his hand. You shall come home with me and have some supper, before I take you back myself to Jamaica Inn. He spoke with such solicitude and yet with such calm authority that Mary sighed with relief, 
throwing all responsibility aside for the time being, content to trust herself in his keeping. Looking up at her, she noticed his eyes from beneath the brim of his hat. They were strange eyes, transparent like glass, so pale in colour that they seemed near to white, a freak of nature she had never known before. They fastened upon her and searched her, as though her very thoughts could not be hidden. His hair was white under his black shovel hat, and Mary stared back at him, for his face was unlined and his voice was not that of an elderly man. Then, with a little rush of embarrassment, she understood the reason for his abnormality. He was an albino. He took off his hat and bared his head before her. Perhaps I had better introduce myself, he said with a smile. My name is Francis Davy, and I am the vicar of Altonen. There was something strangely peaceful about the house. Mary spread her hands to the log fire. The silence was pleasing to her. It soothed her weariness and took away her fear. This was a different world from Jamaica Inn. There the silence was oppressive and heavy with malice. The disused rooms stank of neglect. Here it was different. Her eyes wandered about the room, and she accepted without question the walls bare of the usual biblical themes, the polished desk empty of papers and books that in her mind were associated with the living room of a rectory. It was a novelty to be waited upon, but the vicar made it seem a natural, everyday occurrence that Mary was without embarrassment. He poured her out a steaming cup of tea, heaping into it a spoonful of cream. It was providential that I should come upon you on the moor tonight, he said, when she had pushed away her plate and sunk once more into the chair. The warmth of the room and the hot tea had made her drowsy, and his gentle voice came to her from far away. But there was a new insistence there. Why did you wander on the moor tonight? Scarcely aware of how it happened, Mary heard her voice reply to his. I'm in terrible trouble. Sometimes I think I should become like my aunt and go out of my mind. Every night I go to bed wondering if I shall wake up and hear the wagons. The first time they brought great parcels and boxes that the men stored in the barred room at the pub. A man was killed that night. I saw the rope hanging from the beam downstairs. She broke off, the warm colour flooding her face. I've never told anyone before. I shouldn't have said it. For a little while he did not answer and then spoke gently and slowly, like a father who reassures a frightened child. Your secret is safe. No one shall know of this but me. You're very tired. When you are rested, I'll take you back in the trap, and I'll make your excuses myself to the landlord. Oh, you mustn't do that. If he suspects half of what I've done tonight, he would kill me and you too. He must never know I've been here, or that I've met you even. Isn't your imagination running away with you a little? Men don't murder without reason. Having gone so far, don't you think you had better let me hear the rest of your story? Mary looked up at the pale eyes in the colourless face, and she thought again how strange a freak of nature was this man, who might be twenty-one, who might be sixty and who, with his soft, persuasive voice, would compel her to admit every secret her heart possessed. She could trust him. That at least was certain. She turned the words over in her mind, then plunged into her story with jerky, ill-framed sentences, beginning with that first Saturday night in the bar, to Mr. Bassett's visit, and following her uncle onto the moors. Her tale sounded unconvincing, even to herself who knew the truth of it. Her great fatigue made her labour in the telling of it. The fear she had sustained, the agony and the doubt, sounded to her ears like the worked-up invention of an overstimulated mind. When she had finished, the vicar began to pace about the room. Then he came to a standstill on the hearth, with his back to the fire, and looked down upon her but Mary could read nothing from his eyes. 
I believe you, of course. But your story wouldn't hold up in a court of law. It's too much of a fairy tale. And another thing. It's a scandal and an outrage, but smuggling is rife all over the county, and half the magistrates do very well out of it. What do you suggest I should do? I am your friend, and you can trust me. Keep a close watch on your uncle, and when the wagons come again, you can report at once to me. Altonen is only a few miles by the high road. If you come and I'm not in, Hannah, my housekeeper, will look after you. Now, that's a bargain between us, isn't it? The night was fine, and the sky ablaze with stars as Frances Davy drove her back to Jamaica Inn. Mary sat beside him on the high seat of the dog cart. It was a strange, exhilarating drive. The climb from Altonen had been slow at first, but once they were upon the high road, the vicar pricked the cob with his whip so that he laid his ears flat to his head and galloped like a mad thing. He made no effort to rein in the horse, and, glancing up at him, Mary saw that he was smiling. Go on. His voice was low and excited, as though he were talking to himself. Go on. You can go faster than this. The effect was unnatural, a little startling, and Mary was aware of a feeling of discomfiture, as though he had betaken himself to another world and had forgotten her existence. Seated where she was, she could observe him for the first time in profile. He looked like a bird. Crouched in his seat, with his black cape coat blown out by the wind, his arms were like wings. Then he smiled down at her and was human again. In front of them stretched the climb to the high, unsheltered ground, and Mary could see the tall chimneys of Jamaica Inn outlined against the sky. The drive was ended, and the exhilaration went from her. The old dread and loathing for her uncle returned. The vicar stopped his horse just short of the yard, under the lee of the grass bank. Mary led the way round to the other side of the house and turned suddenly, her finger to her lips. There was a light in the kitchen. That meant her uncle was there. She leant back against the wall of the house. Her companion motioned her to be still. She watched him as he stood there for a few minutes, gazing into the kitchen. Then he beckoned to her. There was a tense smile on his face she had noticed before. There'll be no argument tonight with the landlord of Jamaica Inn. The kitchen was lit by a single candle. Joss Merlin was sprawled at the table in a drunken stupor, his great legs stretched out on either side of him, his hat on the back of his head. He stared before him at the guttering candle, his eyes glazed and fixed like a dead man. A bottle lay smashed on the table. The peat fire had smouldered itself to nothing. Francis Davy pointed to the open door. You can walk inside and go upstairs to bed. Your uncle will not even see you. Good night to you, Mary Yellen. If you are ever in trouble and need me, I shall be waiting for you at Altonen. Then he turned the corner of the house and was gone. Mary tiptoed into the kitchen and closed and fastened the door. Her uncle had gone to his kingdom of heaven, and the little world was lost to him. She blew out the light beside him and left him alone in the darkness. Joss Merlin was drunk for five days. He lay stretched out on a bed in the kitchen, sleeping with his mouth wide open, and the sound of his breathing could be heard from the bedrooms above. About five in the evening, he would wake for half an hour or so, shouting for brandy and sobbing like a child. Aunt Patience became another woman, showing a calm coolness 
and a presence of mind, she gave herself up entirely to nursing her husband. The weather was cold and grey, but on the fifth morning the wind dropped and the sun shone, and Mary decided to brave the moors again. She had walked for an hour and was leaning against a gate watching some ponies, when she saw a man coming down the track. She was about to move and continue her walk when he waved and shouted to her. It was Jem Merlin. There was no time to escape, and she stood where she was until he came to her. He laughed at her. So you found your way to me, have you? I didn't expect you so soon. What would you have done if I hadn't been at home? Mary could not help smiling. I didn't even know you lived here. I'd have turned left if I'd known. I don't believe you. You started out with the hope of sighting me, and it's no use pretending any different. Well, you've come at a good time to cook my dinner. There's a piece of mutton in the kitchen. I suppose you can cook. Mary looked him up and down. Do you always make use of folk this way? He led the way up the mud track and, rounding the corner, they came to a small grey cottage on the side of a hill. Once inside, Mary looked about her in dismay. The floor was filthy. In half an hour she had the kitchen scrubbed clean and the mutton boiling in the saucepan on the fire, surrounded by potato and turnip. Jem came in at the door, sniffing the air like a hungry dog. Will you leave your aunt? Come look after me. You'd have to pay me too much, Mary countered. You'd never have money enough for what I'd ask. She put the steaming mutton down in front of him, and he smacked his lips. We were all born here, Jem said, jerking his head to the ceiling. I was an afterthought. Father got drunk at Launceston Fair after selling three cows that didn't belong to him. If it wasn't for that, I wouldn't be sitting there talking to you now. Mary got up and began to clear away the plates. How's the landlord of Jamaica in? said Jem, tilting back on his chair and watching her dip the plates in water. Drunk, like his father before him? That'll be the ruin of Joss, said his brother seriously. He soaks himself insensible, but when he comes to, he's dangerous then. You look out for yourself. You'll not touch me. He's got other things to worry him. Mary watched him over the plate she was wiping. We had Squire Bassett call last week. Jem brought his chair to the ground with a crash. The devil you did. She told him about the visit and how the squire seemed disappointed not to find anything. He asked after you as it happened, and I told him I'd never set eyes on you. Jem's expression was blank as Mary told her tale. But at the mention of his name, he laughed. <laughs> Why do you lie to him? Seem less trouble. But you've got nothing to hide, have you? Nothing much, except that black pony you saw by the brook belongs to him, said Jem carelessly. The pony had been dapple grey last week, he told her. He'd make a few pounds with him at Launceston on Christmas Eve. The dealers there would swallow him up. Uh, it's lucky for Joss the stuff had been shifted. It's only a matter of time before they catch him. All he does is get drunk like a damn fool. Mary said nothing. If Jem was trying to tap her by this exhibition of frankness, he would be disappointed. Why are you so silent about it all? Damn it, Mary, you're not blind or deaf. Even a child would smell a rat if he left a month at Jamaica Inn. What are you trying to make me tell you? As for your brother, his life is his own and so is his business. Nothing to do with me. Jem whistled and kicked at a loose stone with his foot. So smuggling don't appall you. But supposing it was a question of life and death and perhaps murder. What then? He turned round and faced her. His eyes were grave, but she could not read what lay behind them. I don't know what you mean. 
He looked at her for a long time without speaking. Perhaps not, but you'll come to know if you stay long enough. Why does your aunt look like a living ghost? Ask her next time the wind blows from the northwest. So there was something behind the smuggling after all. The stranger in the bar that night had talked of murder, and now Jem himself had echoed his words. The conversation had cast a shadow on her day. She began to walk slowly down the hill when she heard his running footsteps behind her. What's the matter with you? He took her chin in his hands and looked into her face. I believe you're frightened of me. We're a desperate lot of fellows, we Merlins, and Jem is the worst of the pack. Is that what you're thinking? She smiled in spite of herself. Something of the sort. I'd even like you if you didn't remind me so much of your brother. I can't help my face, and I'm much better looking than Joss. They arrived at the gate over the stream. Mary Yallant, you'll be coming to Launceston with me on Christmas Eve. You'll be best away from Jamaica in that day. Joss will be recovering from his brandy bed by then and looking for trouble. I bring you home by midnight. Say you'll come, Mary. I make no promises. Mary said as she leapt boldly across the running brook and walked away up the hill without a backward glance. Darkness was falling as she crossed the high road and into the yard. The door of the kitchen was opened immediately by her aunt, who seemed pale and anxious. Your uncle has been asking for you all day. Where have you been? This was the old aunt Patience with nervous hands and twitching mouth, and Mary caught something of her agitation. She had been bold enough on the moors, but no sooner was she inside the inn than her courage left her. Mary looked towards the bed in the corner of the kitchen. It was empty. Joss had moved to the parlour. They ate their supper of cold pie early. The long evening passed, and there was no call from the landlord. Aunt Patience went up to bed, while Mary felt the lethargy of sleep steal upon her. When she woke, the kitchen was cold. And the candle had burnt low. As she stretched, she saw the door of the kitchen open very slowly, little by little, an inch at a time. Then it was flung wide, and Jos Merlin stood on the threshold of the room. Slowly, he turned in her direction, and stared at her without speaking. His face was a grey mask, drained of its usual colour. His bloodshot eyes fastened themselves upon her without recognition. Mary waited, holding her breath. He stepped forward into the room, his hands feeling the air as he crept slowly towards her. He crouched down, staring down at her, and then he leant forward, and touched her hair and her lips. Mary, is it you, Mary? Where have they gone? Have you seen them? There's no one here. Only me. He looked about him in the half light, searching the corners of the room. They can't scare me. Dead men don't harm the living. They're blotted out, like a candle. That's it, isn't it, Mary? She nodded. He sat down, his arms outstretched on the table. He sighed heavily. <sighs> his dreams, all、oh, dreams. The faces stand out like live things in the darkness. I, I'm thirsty, Mary. Go and fetch me some brandy. When she returned, he filled his glass half full, and watched her over the rim. He beckoned her to his side. You got guts in you. I can see that. You're not scared like your aunt. We ought to be partners, you and I. He seized hold of Mary's arm. I have dreams, nightmares. I see things that never scare me when I'm sober. He had killed men with his own hand, beaten them with rocks and stones, 
and afterwards he had slept in his bed like a child. But when he was drunk, he saw them in his dreams. There was a woman once. She was clinging to a raft, and she had her child in her arms. Her hair was streaming down her back. The ship was close in on the rocks, and the sea was as flat as your hand. She cried out for me to help her. I smashed her face in with a stone. She let go of the child. I hit her again. They drowned in four feet of water. We were scared then that some of them would reach the shore. We had to pelt them all with stones, Mary. We had to break their arms and legs. And they drowned in front of us. His face was close to Mary, his red flecked eyes staring into hers. Did you never hear of wreckers before? Outside in the passage, the clock struck one o'clock. That sound rings in my head. When it struck one just now, it was like the tolling of a bow boy in a bay. It's a mournful, weary sound. It rubs on your nerves. You have to muffle them to silence them. Maybe it's a misty night and there's a ship listening for the boy and no sound comes to her. She comes in then, driving through the fog. She comes straight into us who are waiting for her. We see her shudder suddenly and strike. And then the surf has her. Dead man. Tell no tales, Mary. She felt deadly sick. Perhaps if she pressed her hands against her eyes, she would blot out his face and the pictures he had painted for her. She could hear the scream of terror and the cries. She could hear the mournful clamour of the bellboy as it swayed backwards and forwards in the sea. Mary and Aunt Patience shared a secret now. She had lost her fear of him. There was only loathing and disgust left in her heart. He had lost all hold on humanity. He was a beast that walked by night. Now that she had seen him drunk, and she knew him for what he was, he could not frighten her. That night, Mary had grown older. On Christmas Eve, the sky was overcast and threatened rain. Mary leant out of the window, and the soft, wet wind blew upon her face. In an hour's time, Jem Merlin would be waiting for her on the moor to take her to Launceston Fair. Whether she met him or not depended upon herself, and she could not make up her mind. Something inside her responded to him. It nagged at her and would not let her be. She knew she would have to see him again. She waited on the high ground above Rushyford, and in the distance she saw the little cavalcade approach her, the pony, the jingle, and two horses tethered behind. Jem whistled as he approached her, and flung a small package at her feet. A happy Christmas to you. I had a silver piece in my pocket yesterday, and it burnt an owl. There's a new handkerchief for your head. She climbed into the cart beside him. So you're going to sell two ponies at the fair, then? Double profit, Mary Ellen. And you shall have a new dress if you help me. Don't smile and shrug your shoulder. What's the matter with you? Your colour is gone. You've no light in your eyes. Don't lie to me, Mary. I'm not as blind as you think. What's happened at Jamaica Inn? They jogged along in silence. She glanced down at his hands. They had the same strength, the same grace as his brother's. She realised that aversion and attraction ran side by side. The thought was an unpleasant one. Jem was too like his brother. His eyes and his mouth and his smile. 
That was the danger of it, and she realised why Aunt Patience had made a fool of herself ten years ago. It would be easy enough to fall in love with Jem Merlin. His voice broke in upon her thoughts. You gonna tell me, or do you want me to guess? There's no mystery in it. You asked me last time we met if I knew why my aunt looked like a living ghost. Well, I know now, that's all. Jem watched her with curious eyes. When your brother gets drunk, he finds his memory and talks to himself. This time he was not alone. I happened to be there when he woke from his dreams. The pony picked up his feet and broke into a trot. What are you going to do about it? Mary hadn't made up her mind. There were gaps in the story, and Jem fitted remarkably well into some of them. So you think I wreck ships and stand on the shore and watch men drown? Oh, it makes a pretty picture. I'll tell you one thing, Mary Ellen, and you can believe it or not. I've never killed a man. Yet. He looked down at her, half contemptuous, half amused. If she didn't believe him, he asked, why did she ride with him to Launceston? For the sake of your bright eyes, Jem Merlin. And she met his glance without a tremor. He laughed at that and shook his head and fell to whistling again. Away from the shadow of Jamaica Inn, Mary's natural youth and her spirits returned. By the time they clattered into Launceston at half past two in the afternoon, Mary had thrown trouble and responsibility to the winds and had melted to Jem's mood. There was an infection in the air caught from the sound and bustle of the town, a sense of excitement and well-being, a sense of Christmas. The streets were thronged with people. There was colour and life and movement. The cheerful crowd jostled one another before the market stalls. Turkeys and geese scratched at the wooden barrier that penned them. They stabled the pony and jingle at the top of the town, and Jem pushed his way through the crowd, leading his two stolen horses, making straight for the main square, where the whole of Launceston gathered, and the booths and tents of the Christmas fair stood end to end. There was a place roped off from the fair for the buying and selling of livestock, and the ring was surrounded by farmers and country gentlemen. Jem wore his hat at the back of his head. He looked cool and unperturbed. Presently, a flashy-looking dealer thrust his way through the crowd and crossed over to the horses and was joined by a little lynx-eyed man in a black coat. Jem puffed at his pipe. This black pony here, you can't fault him. Look at those shoulders. There's breeding for you. I'll take eighteen guineas for him. The dealer hesitated and offered fifteen. The lynx-eyed man plucked at his sleeve and whispered in his ear. The dealer pulled a face and then he nodded. All right, you've got an eye for trouble. You can keep your pony. Take my advice. Come down on your price. If you have him on your hands for long, you'll be sorry. And he elbowed his way through the crowd. No one came near the black pony again. At a quarter to four, Jem sold the other horse for six pounds to a cheerful, honest-looking farmer. Twilight gathered in the market square and the lamps were lit. Mary was thinking of returning to the jingle when she turned and saw a lady in a feathered hat and a blue velvet cape. She was admiring the black pony. The woman gave a little trill of laughter. It would be such a good Christmas present for the children. They've plagued poor Roger ever since Beauty disappeared. Ask him the price, James. Twenty-five guineas, said Jem promptly. He's promised to a friend I'm not anxious to sell him. The lady swept into the ring. I've set my heart on him. I'll give you thirty for him. I'm Mrs Bassett from North Hill. My groom shall fetch the pony immediately and ride him back home. Jem swept off his hat and bowed low. Thank you, madam. I hope Squire Bassett will be pleased with your bargain. You will find the pony exceedingly safe with children. 
she made her way towards the coach, her petticoats fluttering behind her. Jem gave a five-shilling piece to a lad to wait and hand over the pony to the groom when he appeared. Then he was off in a moment, walking hard across the square. Mary followed, a discreet ten paces behind. The laughter bubbled up inside her, and she hid her mouth in her shawl. Jem, Merlin, you deserve to be hanged, she said when she had recovered herself. To sell that stolen pony back to Mrs. Bassett herself, you have the cheek of the devil. He threw back his head and laughed, and she could not resist him. Their laughter echoed in the street until people turned to look at them, and they too smiled and broke into laughter. Jem caught at her hand and crumpled the fingers. You're glad you came now, aren't you? He said. And she was. They plunged into the thick of the fair. Jem bought Mary a crimson shawl and gold rings for her ears. They sucked oranges beneath a striped tent, and had their fortunes told by a wrinkled gypsy woman. Beware of a dark stranger, she said to Mary, and they looked at one another and laughed again. There's blood in your hand, young man, she told Jem. You'll kill a man one day. She remembered what he had told her in the jingle that morning. He was innocent. Did she believe him now? Jem dragged Mary under cover of a doorway, his arms around her shoulders, and he turned her face against him and held her with his hands, and kissed her. The rain came and the wind rose in gusts. Jem shielded Mary from the weather. She felt the tips of his fingers on her neck, travelling to her shoulders, and she put up her hands and pushed them away. I've made a fool of myself long enough for one night, Jem Merlin. It's time we thought of returning. You don't want to ride an open jingle in this one. We'll be blown over on the high ground. We'll have to spend the night together in Launceston. Very likely. And we'll fetch the pony, Jem. I'll wait for you here. Don't be a Puritan, Mary. You'll be soaked to the skin on the Bodman Road. Pretend you're in love with me, can't you? You'd stay with me then. If I kissed you again, would you change your mind? I would not. He bowed his head against the rain and she saw him disappear around the corner. Mary waited, stamping her feet and blowing upon her hands. The long minutes passed, and still he did not come. Somewhere a clock struck eight. He had been gone over half an hour, and the place where the pony and jingle were stabled was only five minutes away. At last Mary could stand it no longer, and she set off up the hill in search of him. She came to the stable where they had left the pony and jingle, but it was empty. The fellow who had admitted them to the shed earlier told her that Jem had left in a great hurry some twenty minutes ago with one of the servants from the White Hart. Mary retraced her steps in the direction of the town. What should Jem want with one of the servants from the White Hart? In the bar, Mary recognised the dealer and the little lynx-eyed man. She was aware of a sudden sense of foreboding, and turned at once for the door, but the lynx-eyed man was there before her. If it's the dark gypsy fellow you're looking for, I can tell you about him, he said, smiling wide, showing a row of broken teeth. Jem had been in the company of a gentleman, he told her, and although he tried to resist, he was persuaded, with their help, to enter a carriage. He pulled a face of mock pity. No doubt you knew what became of the black pony. The price he was asking was undoubtedly high. So the worst had happened, and the theft of the pony had been discovered. Did they hang men for that as well as murder? For the moment, she was stunned. If she had consented to stay in Launceston, this would never have happened. They would have found a room in the town somewhere. She would have been beside him now, and they would have loved one another. 
She went away down the road, driven like a leaf before the wind, with the mizzling rain driving in her face, caring little where she went, and careless of the fact that eleven long miles lay between her and her bedroom at Jamaica Inn. Then, out of the darkness, she saw a carriage crawling up the hill towards her. It looked like a beetle, stubby and black. She watched it with dull eyes. The sight conveyed no message to her brain, except that somewhere on an unknown road, Jem Merlin travelled to his death, perhaps by the same manner. The carriage had crept up to her and was passing by before she ran towards it on an impulse and called to the driver. He whipped his horse on, but before Mary could step aside, an arm came out of the carriage window and a hand was laid on her shoulder. What does Mary Yellen do alone in Launceston on Christmas Eve? said a voice from within. The hand was firm, but the voice was gentle. A pale face stared at her from the dark interior of the carriage. White hair and white eyes beneath a black shovel hat. It was the vicar of Altonen. So we ride together for a second time. His voice was soft and low, like the voice of a woman. Once more, I have the good fortune to help you by the wayside. In the carriage, Mary found herself telling the vicar everything that had happened that day in Launceston. And then, in a whisper, she recounted the horrors she had learned about her uncle's involvement in wrecking and murder on the coast. The vicar's face beneath the black shovel hat turned towards her. So the landlord talks when he is drunk. And it seemed to Mary that his voice lacked something of its usual gentle quality. But when she looked up at him... His eyes stared back at her, cold and impersonal as ever. When my uncle has lived on brandy for five days, he'll bear his soul before the world. That's why I know. Francis Davy leant forward in his seat. They were approaching the turning to Altonen. The driver will take you on to Jamaica Inn. Then he asked, Am I the only man you have honoured with your confidence? Or do I share it with the landlord's brother? Jem Merlin knows. He said little, though, and I know he is not friendly with my uncle. Anyway, it doesn't matter now. Jem rides to custody for another crime. As he stepped out into the road, the vicar bared his head under the rain, and she saw the thick white hair frame his face like a halo. He smiled and bowed. Sleep well tonight. Tomorrow is Christmas Day, and the bells of Altonen will be ringing for peace and goodwill. I shall think of you. He waved his hand to the driver, and the carriage went on without him. Mary sat in the corner, and through the window the voices of men came out of the darkness. In the distance were the lean chimneys of Jamaica Inn crowning the skyline like a gallows. Down the road came a company of men, a shot rang out, and the driver of the carriage crumpled in his seat and fell. A face was thrust in at the carriage window, a face crowned with matted hair that fell in a fringe above the scarlet, bloodshot eyes. Joss Merlin smiled. The crazy, delirious smile of a man possessed, maddened, and exalted by drink. He levelled the pistol at Mary. Then he wrenched open the door and pulled her out onto the road, holding the lantern above his head so that all could see her. There were ten or twelve men, ragged and unkempt, half of them as drunk as their leader, and when they saw who she was, a howl of laughter broke out, and Harry the peddler put his two fingers to his mouth and whistled. Mary said nothing. So you're dumb, are you? her uncle cried, hitting her across the face with the back of his hand and laughing at her cry of pain. Leave me alone. You're a bloody murderer and a thief. Your reign is over, Uncle Joss. I've been launched in the day to inform against you. 
A hubbub rose. The men pressed forward, shouting at her and questioning, but the landlord roared at them, waving them back. Get back, you damned fools! Can't you see she's trying to save her skin by lies? How can she inform against me when she knows nothing? Come on, you lazy, drunken devils! Let's get to the coast. Don't you want to feel gold and silver run through your hands? Joss Merlin stood for a moment, looking down upon Mary with a foolish, drunken smile. Then, on a sudden impulse, he caught her in his arms and pulled her towards the carriage. He threw her onto the seat in the corner and yelled to Harry the peddler to whip the horse up the hill. You'd inform against me, would you? You'd have me swinging on a rope's end like a cat. All right then, you shall stand on the shore, Mary, with the wind and the sea in your face, and you shall watch for the dawn and the coming in of the tide. You know what that means, don't you? You know where I'm taking you. She stared back at him in horror. The colour drained from her face. Mary shrank closer in her corner, away from the hot animal smell of her uncle, and resigned herself to the movement of the swaying, jolting carriage. It was the cessation of movement that dragged her back to the world. The sudden stillness, the cold, damp air blowing upon her face through the open carriage window. She was alone. The men had gone, taking their light with them. The carriage had been abandoned in a narrow gully. She listened intently. Borne up to her on the wind, came a sound at once sullen and familiar—a sound that, for the first time in her life, she could not welcome. The sound of the sea. Mary shuddered. Somewhere in the darkness below, her uncle and his companions waited for the tide. Now that her senses were her own again, Mary found inactivity impossible. The carriage door was locked, but she struggled and pushed herself through the narrow window frame. She felt her way along the narrow ditch, stumbling over the stones, and did not see the humped figure of a man kneeling in the ditch, his eyes watchful of the lane ahead. She came against him, knocking the breath from her body, and he, taken by surprise, fell with her, crying out in mingled terror and rage, smashing at her with his clenched fist. It was Harry the peddler. He fought for possession of her, and she knew it. Aware that his strength was greater than hers, she lay limp suddenly to deceive him, giving him the advantage for the moment. He grunted in triumph, and as he moved his position, she thrust her fingers in his eyes. While he was momentarily blinded, she ran like a hunted creature up the twisting lane, tripping and stumbling over the ruts in the path. Her one idea was to escape from the thing that was Harry the Peddler. It seemed as though she could hear the sea on every side of her now. The breakers, though she could not see them because of the fog, were louder and clearer. She crawled on uncertainly and knelt amongst driftwood and loose shingle. While not fifty yards away and directly in front of her, with a high combing seas breaking upon the shore. After a while, when her eyes had accustomed themselves to the shadows, she saw the little knot of men huddled against a jagged rock, peering ahead of them into the darkness. Their very stillness made them more menacing, and the attitude of stealth, the tense watchfulness, was a sight at once fearful and pregnant with danger. The mist began to lift very slowly. To the right, in the distance, where the highest part of the cliff sloped to the sea, Mary made out a faint pinprick of light. At first, she thought it a star piercing the last curtain of dissolving mist. But reason told her that no star was white, nor ever swayed with the wind on the surface of a cliff. The group of men on the shingle below heeded it not. Their eyes were turned to the dark sea beyond the breakers, and suddenly Mary was aware of the reason for their indifference, and the small white eye that had seemed at first a thing of friendliness and comfort became a symbol of horror. The star was a false light placed there by her uncle and his companions, and out of the mist and darkness came another pinprick of light in answer to the first. 
This new light did not dance and waver like the one on the cliff. It dipped low and was hidden, and then it would rise again, pointing high to the sky. The new light drew nearer to the first. The one compelled the other, and still the men crouched motionless upon the narrow strand, waiting for the lights to close with one another. Mary could see the shadowed outline of a hull. Closer drew the mast light to the flare upon the cliff, fascinated and held like a moth coming to a candle. Mary could bear no more. She scrambled to her feet and ran down upon the beach, shouting and crying, pitting her voice against the wind and the sea, which tossed it back to her. Someone caught hold of her. Hands stifled her. She was trodden upon and kicked. Her cries died away, smothered by the coarse sacking that choked her, and her arms were dragged behind her back and knotted together, the rough cords searing her flesh. Then they left her there. Mary saw the black mass that had been a vessel roll slowly upon its side like a great flat turtle. Clinging to its slippery, sloping surface were little black dots that stuck themselves fast to the splintering wood like limpets. And when the heaving, shuddering mass beneath them broke monstrously in two, they fell one by one into the white tongues of the sea, little black dots without life or substance. A deadly sickness came upon Mary, and she closed her eyes. The men who had waited during the cold hours waited no more. They ran like madmen, hither and thither upon the beach, yelling and screaming, demented and inhuman. They waded waist deep into the breakers, careless of danger, all caution spent, snatching at the bobbing, sodden wreckage borne in on the surging tide. When the first body was washed ashore, they clustered around it, diving amongst the remains with questing, groping hands, picking it clean as a bone. And, when they had stripped it bare, tearing at the smashed fingers in search of rings, they abandoned it, leaving it to loll upon its back in the scum where the tide had been. Whatever had been the practice hitherto, there was no method in their work tonight. They robbed haphazardly, each man for himself. The tide turned, the water receded. A grey colour came upon the water and was answered by the sky. At first the men did not notice the change, they were delirious still, intent upon their prey. Then Joss Merlin lifted his great head and sniffed the air. And he shouted, calling the men to silence, pointing to the sky. They hesitated, glancing at the wreckage unclaimed and waiting to be salvaged. And then they turned and began to run, silent once more, their faces grey and scared. They had outstayed their time. Success had made them careless. The dawn had broken upon them unawares, and by lingering over long they had risked the accusation which daylight would bring to them. It was Joss Merlin who pulled the sacking away from Mary's mouth and threw her over his shoulder as he would a sack. He ran with her up the strand to the entrance of the gully, and his companions, caught up in a mesh of panic, flung the remnants of spoil upon the backs of the three horses tethered there. Some of them began to scatter, forgetting everything in a blind concentration on personal safety. There was a wild rush to the remaining farm cart, and the riot that followed was a hideous scrap. Those who carried pistols now had the advantage, and the landlord, with his remaining ally, Harry the Peddler, stood with their backs to the cart and let fly with bullets amongst the rabble. It was the blood that won the cart for the landlord. For the remaining rebels, hysterical and lost at the sight of their dying fellows, turned and scuttled away like crabs up the twisting lane. Joss and the peddler wasted little time. What wreckage had been salvaged they threw upon the cart beside Mary. Miscellaneous odds and ends, useless and unprofitable, the main store still down on the beach and washed by the tide. Lying on her back in the cart, Mary watched the low clouds pass across the sky. Darkness had gone. She could still hear the sound of the sea, more distant and less insistent. From far away, 
across many fields and scattered ploughlands, came the merry peal of bells, odd and discordant in the morning air. She remembered suddenly that it was Christmas Day. Mary moaned. She was lying in her bedroom at Jamaica Inn. There was a face bending down to her, the eyes tremulous and blue. Aunt Patience, I've gone through enough out of loyalty to you. You can't expect any more. Whatever Uncle Joss may have been of you once, he is inhuman now. Mary's voice rose dangerously high. Too late, Aunt Patience tried to silence her. The door opened and Uncle Joss stood on the threshold of the room. He was filthy and unwashed, and there were black shadows beneath his eyes. I thought I heard voices in the yard. Did you hear anything? He sat down on the bed, his restless eyes roaming from the window to the door. He'll come. He's bound to come. I've cut my own throat. He warned me once, and I didn't listen. I wanted to play the game on my own. We were as good as dead, all three of us. He looked from one to the other of them, his bloodshot eyes hollow. They stared back at him without understanding. Dumbfounded and awed at the expression on his face they had not seen before. Who are you afraid of? said Mary at length. Who warned you? He shook his head. No, I'm not drunk now, Mary Ellen. My secrets are still my own. The old cunning was once more in his eyes. You'd like to know, wouldn't you? You'd like to sneak out of the house with a name on your lips and betray me. You'd like to see me hanged. He shambled to his feet and led the way into the kitchen. The door was bolted, the window barred, with two candles on the table to light the room. Reaching for a chair, he straddled his legs across it. We've got to think out a plan of campaign. We've been sitting here for two days and I've had enough. He puffed a while at his pipe, staring moodily at the floor, tapping his foot on the stone flags. Mary glanced at him. If she and her aunt Patience were to come out of this alive... She must give her uncle rope enough to hang himself. She had one hope of salvation. The vicar was not five miles away, waiting in Alternan for a signal from her. Suddenly, Joss stood up, his face as white as a sheet. Listen. Listen. Something was scraping gently at the kitchen window, tapping lightly, softly, scratching furtively at the pane of glass. His fingers fastened upon his gun. He waited beside the closed shutters and then sprang forward, tearing at the hinge, pulling them apart. A livid face was pressed against the pane, broken teeth gaping in a grin. It was Harry the peddler. Sitting in the kitchen, the peddler explained the county was ringing with the news of what happened on Christmas Eve, and folk were mad for blood and justice. Their only chance was to run for it. So you'll throw your hand in too, Harry, will you? Run with your tail between your legs. Have they any proof? Has your liver conscious gone against you? The peddler explained it was common sense. This part of the country had become unhealthy, He'd risk his neck coming out to the inn to give Joss warning. Particularly in view of the fact that he reckoned it was Joss's own stupidity that had brought them into this mess. He had got them drunk. They had all lost their heads and left the booty and a hundred tracks scattered on the shore. Joss Merlin considered him for a moment. So you accuse me, do you, Harry? You're like the rest of your kind, wriggling like a snake when the look of the game turns against you. You've done well out of me. You've had gold to burn you never had before. The peddler thrust his yellow, impudent face close to the landlord. 
Do you play a double game up here at Jamaica Inn? I've seen things sometimes I haven't understood and heard things too. Do you take your orders from one above you, Joss Merlin? The landlord caught the peddler on the point of his chin with his clenched fist and the man went over backwards onto his head. Joss towered above him, the muzzle of his gun pointed at the peddler's throat. Mary watched her uncle closely. She had no clue to his state of mind. He lowered his gun. I'm the leader, and always have been. I take orders. I like to see the man who dare to try me. Well, it's over now. You didn't come here tonight to warn me. You came to see what you could get out of the smash. You little rat, Harry. The peddler passed his tongue over his lips and swallowed. Very well. With your help, my loving friend, we'll take the road to Devon. Tomorrow is Sunday, and a blessed day of rest. They'll not go seeking the devil on the Sabbath. He raised his gun again, edging the cold muzzle close to the man's throat. The peddler whimpered, showing the whites of his eyes. Come on, <laughs> your hands have been itching to explore the wreckage we brought from the shore. You shall spend the night in the storm amongst it all. After he had turned the key on his friend, the landlord returned to the kitchen. I thought Harry would turn sour. He turned to Mary. You better get to bed. You have a long journey tomorrow night, and it won't be an easy one. The fact that Mary would not be going with him did not concern her for the moment. Tired as she was, her mind was seething with plans. Her uncle followed her to her bedroom. She was strangely thankful that he had decided to lock her in that night. While he was going to sit in the kitchen, his gun across his knee, waiting for something? For someone? As she handed him her key, her uncle lowered his voice. There is danger from me ahead. Never mind the law. This other game I have to watch for. Footsteps, Mary. That come in the night and go again. And a hand that would strike me down. His face looked lean and old in the half-light. And there was a flicker of meaning in his eyes that leapt like a flame to tell her. And then dulled again. Mary awoke to a shower of earth flung against her bedroom window. The night was black still, and standing directly beneath the porch was Jem Merlin. He hauled himself up onto the porch. Her window opened only a foot. They stared at one another for a moment through the gap. He looked worn, and his eyes were hollow like one who has not slept and has endured fatigue. I owe you an apology, he said at length. I deserted you without excuse at Lanston on Christmas Eve. You can forgive me or not as you feel, but the reason for it... that I can't give you. I'm sorry. He did not ask how she returned that night, and his indifference stunned her. I know what you think of me, but I'm treading delicate ground, Mary, and one false start will finish me. Where is my brother? In the kitchen. He's afraid of something. Or someone. The windows and the doors are barred. And he has his gun. Jem laughed harshly. <laughs> I don't doubt he's afraid. He'll be more frightened still before many hours are passed. Mary imparted the news that Joss intended leaving Jamaica Inn at nightfall the following day. She watched Jem. Tortured by doubt and indecision, she was thrown back now upon her old suspicion of him. Was he the hated and feared visitor expected by her uncle? The sneering face of the peddler returned to her. Listen here, Jock Smerlin. Do you take your orders from one above you? Jem was like a stranger to her tonight, obsessed by some grim purpose she could not understand. Warning him of the landlord's intended flight had been a false move. It might confound the issue of her plans. Whatever Jem had done or intended to do, whether he were false and treacherous and a murderer of men, she loved him 
and owed him warning. You'd best have a care for yourself. His mood is dangerous. Whoever interferes with his plans now risks his life. I tell you this for your own safety. He leaned forward suddenly and touched the scratch that ran from her forehead to her chin. Mary explained that she got them on Christmas Eve. The gleam in his eye told her at once that he understood and had knowledge of the evening. You were there with them. On the shore. He cursed aloud and smashed the pane of glass with his fist and climbed into the room before she realised what he had done. He lifted her in his arms and traced the bruises with his finger down her neck. Was it my brother who hurt you most? In which case he shall die for this. It was all too late and did not matter now. Her uncle's death would not bring back the men he had killed. Jem was still an unknown quantity, but she realised that by betraying her uncle, she might also betray him. I want you to do something for me. He smiled then for the first time, and her heart leapt at once, encouraged at the change. I want you to go away from here. I can stand up against your brother. I, I don't want you to come here tomorrow. Please promise me you'll go away. He put his arms round her and kissed her then as he had kissed her in Launceston. Play your own game and leave me to play mine, he told her. But for the sake of your face which I have kissed and shall kiss again, keep away from danger. She watched him go, slipping across the yard like a shadow. She sat on her bed and made her plans for the evening to come. During the day, the atmosphere of strain was apparent amongst them all. In silence, haggardly, they waited for the night. At the midday meal, the landlord, who usually had the appetite of an ox, drummed moodily with his fingers on the table, the cold meat on his plate untouched. At last, she took courage in both hands. If we are to travel tonight, she said, keeping her voice as casual as possible, would it not be better if Aunt Patience and myself rested during the afternoon so we can start out fresh upon the journey? He debated the matter a moment and agreed that they could both retire for the afternoon. The first step had been achieved. Mary closed the door of her little room and turned the key. Her heart beat fast at the prospect of adventure. She put on her warmest dress and fastened her old shawl across her shoulders with trembling, hot hands. When the clock in the hall below struck four at last, the strokes rang out in the silence like an alarm. Every second was precious to her now. She crawled onto the sill of the window and jumped. After an hour, she came to the vicarage beside the church at Altonen. There were no lights here. The house was shrouded and silent. She hammered upon the door and she heard the blows echo through the empty house. Then she cursed her stupidity. It was Sunday. The vicar would be in the church. Mary asked a woman carrying flowers from the church if Mr. Davy was there. The woman looked at her curiously and then shook her head. I'm sorry, she said. The vicar went to preach at another parish many miles from here. He's not expected back in Alton and tonight. Mary came at last to North Hill and the manor house belonging to Squire Bassett. She swung the great bell and the sound was met at once by the furious baying of hounds. The door was opened by a manservant. She felt inferior and small and was conscious of her old dress and shawl. I have come to see Mr Bassett on very urgent business. The matter is of desperate importance, otherwise I would not disturb him at such an hour on a Sunday night. Mr. Bassett left for Launceston this morning. He was called away hurriedly, and he has not yet returned. This time she could not control herself, and a cry of despair escaped her. <sighs> if we do not see him within the hour, something terrible will happen, and a great criminal escape the hands of the law. 
Stung with curiosity, the man showed her to the library where Mrs. Bassett was in residence. The room with its blazing fire seemed unreal to her, and she blinked at the flood of light that met her eyes. A woman, whom she recognised immediately as the fine lady from Launceston Market Square, was sitting in a chair before the fire. She looked up in surprise. The servant repeated what Mary had just told him. Please, Mrs. Bassett. Mary asked somewhat impatiently, "I must know when your husband is returning home." "I have no idea," replied his lady. The squire had set out upon a highly dangerous mission. She said he had suspected the innkeeper of Jamaica Inn for some while of terrible crimes, but it was only this morning that proof had come into his hands. He had departed at once for Launceston to summon help, and intended to seize the inhabitants of the inn that night. Something in Mary's face must have warned her, for she turned very pale and reached out for the heavy bell pull that hung on the wall. "You are the girl from the inn, the niece of the landlord. Stay where you are, or I will summon my servants." Mary put out her hand. "The landlord of Jamaica Inn is a relative to me by marriage only. I have definite proof of his guilt, and have come to warn the squire that the landlord intends to leave the inn tonight." Mary sat down and stared blankly at the fire. She had come to the end of her resources. Having spent so long away, her uncle would discover her room empty, and knowing that she had betrayed him, would leave Jamaica Inn before Mister Bassett arrived. When the clock on the mantelpiece chimed eight, Mary could bear it no longer. This dragging inactivity was worse than danger and pursuit. Forgive me," she said, rising to her feet. But I am desperately anxious. I must know what is happening at Jamaica Inn, even if I walk back there myself tonight. Mrs. Bassett stood up in a flutter of distress. Of course you are anxious, but you cannot possibly walk back there now alone. I will order the trap, and Richard shall go with you. He is most trustworthy and dependable, and can be armed in case of need. In a quarter of an hour, the trap drove up to the door. Richards, with two large pistols stuck in his belt, had orders to fire at anyone who threatened the trap. Mary climbed in beside him, fitted out by Mrs. Bassett with a heavy cloak and hood, thick rug, and foot warmer. It was only when the house was out of sight that Mary realized she had set out on what was probably to be a foolhardy and dangerous expedition. The drive was silent for the most part, with no other sound but the steady clopping of the horses' hoofs upon the road. And now and again, an owl hooted from the still trees. The steep hill to Jamaica rose in front of them, white beneath the moon. And as the dark chimneys appeared above the crest, Richards fumbled with the pistols in his belt. Mary's heart beat fast now, and it seemed to her that the clop of the hoofs rang too loudly on the surface of the road, and she wished they had been more silent. As they drew near to Jamaica Inn, Richards whispered in her ear. Would it be best if I go forward and see if they are there? Mary shook her head. From the silence, it seemed as though the landlord had escaped. Better for me to go. I can risk an encounter with my uncle when you could not. Give me a pistol. I shall have little to fear from him then. There were no wheel marks in the yard, no preparations for departure. She crept across to the stable and heard the pony move restlessly in his stall. Then they had not gone. She glanced at the shuttered house. Surely, if her uncle intended to leave, he would have gone before now. Mary hesitated. The situation had become odd now, and unreal. She ventured round the corner of the house. There was no light. The kitchen was black as a pit. She laid her hand on the knob of the door, and to her astonishment, the door opened. This easy entrance shocked her, and she was afraid to enter. No sound came to her. Some instinct told her that the kitchen had been empty for hours. There was a candle on the table, and she thrust it into the feeble glow of the fire, where it took light and flickered. She held it high above her head and looked about her. The kitchen was still strewn with the preparations for departure. The door to the passage was wide open, and the silence became more oppressive than before, strangely and horribly still. 
something was not as it had been. Some sound was lacking that must account for the silence. Then Mary realised that the clock had stopped. She went forward slowly, the candle in one hand and the pistol levelled in the other. She turned the corner and saw that the clock had fallen across the narrow hall, the glass splintered in fragments on the stone flags. It was not until she came to the foot of the stairs that Mary saw what was beyond. The landlord of Jamaica Inn lay on his face amongst the wreckage. He looked even larger in death than he did before. There was blood on the stone floor, and blood between his shoulders, dark now and nearly dry, where the knife had found him. It was a long while before Mary moved. Something of her own strength had ebbed away, leaving her powerless like the figure on the floor. A spider settled on her uncle's hand, and it seemed strange to her that the hand stayed motionless and did not seek to rid itself of the spider. Her uncle would have shaken it free. The spider knew that the landlord could not harm him. Mary knew this too, but she had not lost her fear of him. It was the silence that frightened her most. Now that the clock no longer ticked, her nerves strained for the sound of it. The slow, wheezing choke had been familiar and a symbol of normality. She backed away. The candle flickered in the draught, and when she came to the kitchen, her calm deserted her, and she ran blindly through the door like a thing pursued to where the familiar stalwart figure of the squire's groom confronted her. He stepped. He stepped there on the floor. The groom saw by her face that her strength had gone. He put the cloak around her and helped her up into the trap and climbed onto the seat beside her. They fell silent and both of them watched the road for the coming of the squire. Mary held up a hand. Listen. Can you hear something? They strained their ears to the north. The faint clop of horses was unmistakable, coming from beyond the valley, over the brow of the further hill. The clatter drew near, and Richards, in his relief, ran out upon the road to greet them, shouting and waving his arms. The landlord is dead. Murdered, cried the groom to Squire Bassett. I have his niece here with me in the trap. Mr Bassett directed Richards to take the trap up to the yard and stay with Mary while the squire and his men entered the inn. Presently the bleak and silent house lost its shuttered air as the men explored the empty house. They waited in silence until the squire himself came out into the yard and crossed to the trap. He was sorry, but he had bad news. I don't think your aunt Patience suffered. She must have died at once. She could have known nothing. Believe me, I am very sorry. I wish I could have spared you this. He stood by her, awkward and distressed. And then, seeing that Mary was better left alone and he could not help her, he stamped back across the yard to the inn. Mary sat motionless, shrouded in her cloak, and she prayed in her own way that Aunt Patience would forgive her and that she would understand what she had tried to do. These were the only thoughts that brought her a measure of consolation, since she blamed herself. Had she not left Jamaica Inn, Aunt Patience might not have died. Once again, though, there came a murmur of excitement from the house, and there was a crash of splintering wood, and the shutters were torn away from the window of the barred room. Then, round the corner to the yard, six or seven of them came, led by the squire, holding amongst them something that squirmed and wriggled and fought for release with hoarse, bewildered cries. Mary brushed aside the hood that covered her face and looked down upon the captive who stared up at her. It was Harry the peddler. "'What do you know of this fellow?' the squire said to Mary. "'We found him in the barred room. He denies all knowledge of the crime.' He was of the company. He came to the inn last night and quarrelled with my uncle. He, he locked him up in the borrowed room, threatening him with death. He had every reason to kill my uncle, and no one could have done it but he. He is lying. But the door was locked upon him. 
This fellow had never been from the room at all. Look at his clothes, look at his eyes, dazzled still by the light. He's not your murderer. And Mary knew that what the squire had said was no more than the truth. Harry the peddler could not have committed the crime. He had lain there in the dark for over twenty-four hours, waiting for release. And during the long hours, someone had come to Jamaica Inn and gone again, his work completed in the silence of the night. She waited in the trap, and she neither heard the peddler's blasphemies nor saw his furtive, narrow eyes, for she remembered other eyes that had looked upon her in the morning, and another voice that had spoken calm and cold, saying of his brother, "He shall die for this." There was the sentence flung carelessly on the way to Launceston Fair. I've never killed a man yet. There was the gypsy woman in the market square. There is blood on your hand. You'll kill a man one day. All the little things she would forget rose up again and clamoured against him. But it was his tainted Merlin blood that would betray him, like to like. One of a kind. The whole truth stared up at her in ugliness and horror, and she wished now that she had stayed, and he had killed her too. He was a thief. In the night he had come, and was gone again. She heard the sound of a horse trotting at a steady, even pace. The rhythmic jogging tune had echo in her throbbing heart. The horseman drew rein and turned into the yard. The black riding cape gave no clue to his identity, but when he bowed and bared his head, the thick halo of hair shone white under the moon, and the voice that spoke in answer to the squire was gentle and sweet. Mister Bassett of North Hill, I believe. And he leant forward in his saddle, a note in his hand. I have a message here from Mary Yellen of Jamaica Inn, who asks my help in trouble, but I see that I have come too late. You remember me, of course. We have met before. I am the vicar of Altenen. Mary sat alone in the living room at the vicarage and watched the smouldering turf fire. They had been kind to her and patient too. She had slept long. Now Jem's face was ever present with her. He had been the unknown factor from the beginning to the end, and deliberately she had shut her eyes to the truth. She was a woman, and she loved him. She was bound to him for ever. One word to the vicar when he returned, a message to the squire. And Aunt Patience would be avenged. Jem would die with a rope round his neck, as his father had done, and she would return to Helford, seeking the threads of her old life. As Mary prowled about the room, she felt as though the vicar Francis Davy was watching her. The room was sparsely furnished and free of ornaments and books. Even his desk was bare of correspondence and looked seldom used. There were canvases against the wall. One was an interior of a church with the nave in shadow. There was a strange green afterglow upon the arches that cast a haunting and uncanny light that lingered in her memory. She could not have put her feeling of discomfort into words, but it was as though some spirit had groped its way into the interior and breathed an alien atmosphere upon the shadowed nave. When the vicar returned from his day's work. They sat down together for supper at the table in the living room. Is curiosity dead in Mary Yellen that she does not ask me what I have done with my day? He said, mocking her gently. She apologised, but answered that it was no business of hers. But indeed, it is your business, he replied. Squire Bassett had entertained him to luncheon. He told her to discuss, along with eight or ten others, who could have murdered her uncle. Some progress had been made. The peddler, in an attempt to save his skin, had turned King's evidence, but he had not helped them much except to suggest that the landlord of Jamaica Inn was their leader in name only, 
and that he had had his orders from one above him. If so, it would seem that the unknown leader and the murderer must be one and the same person. That would narrow the field considerably, since they would need to look for someone with a brain and a personality. The general opinion was that the man must know the Moors, or at least have local knowledge. And that is why Mr. Bassett intended to question every inhabitant in the radius of ten miles, so the net would close around the murderer. Then the vicar casually proffered the information that Joss's brother, Jem, had been part of the discussion. His answers were most astute. The gentle voice wore away at her nerves, pin-pricking them with every word. Instinct told her that he played her as an angler plays a fish upon his line. She could no longer keep up the pretense of indifference. What will they do to him, Mr. Davy? The pale, expressionless eyes stared back at her and for the first time she saw a shadow pass across them, and a flicker of surprise. Do? Did you not know that it was Jem Merlin who informed against his brother? She stared at him stupidly. It appeared that the squire, after falling in with Jem at Launceston Fair on Christmas Eve, had struck a bargain that he could go free if he brought him proof that his brother was the man the squire believed him to be. Mary stared before her into space. The evidence she had so fearfully and so painfully built against the man she loved collapsed into nothing, like a pack of cards. She smiled. The anxiety and the dread had gone from her at last. However, it had been Jem Merlin's last remark that had hurried the vicar home. Jem had been suspicious when he had found a brand new horse's nail in the heather near Jamaica Inn. Being a stealer of horses and knowing the work of every blacksmith on the moors, Jem was riding over to the blacksmith at Warleggan to discover who was responsible for the bad workmanship. And in doing so, he would discover the identity of the horse rider. Mary looked puzzled as the vicar continued. Only one traveller passed the blacksmith that day and the time was, I suppose, near seven o'clock in the evening, after which the traveller had continued his journey by way of Jamaica Inn. But how do you know this? Because the traveller was the vicar of Altonen. Mary looked up at him, her hands gripping the sides of her chair. She finally understood. It was he who had killed her uncle. No one had known the secret of their partnership. When Joss Merlin had drunk himself to madness on Christmas Eve, resulting in the abortive wrecking mission, the vicar knew that he had betrayed himself and with the rope around his neck would play his last card and name the vicar as his master. Therefore, he had had to die. He leant down to her, and taking her two hands, he pulled her to her feet. His grip upon her wrists was firm and held no promise of release. You have proved yourself a dangerous opponent, and I prefer you by my side. Are you ready? Your cloak hangs in the hall, and I am waiting. She thought rapidly. If he were insane, and this she believed him to be, then his insanity would bring about his destruction... If he were not mad, she would be a break on his speed, with her girl's wits matched against his brains. Mary made her decision. She had no fear of him, and no fear of the night. Nothing mattered now, because the man she loved was free and had no stain of blood upon him. She could love him without shame. She followed the vicar to the stable where the horses were saddled. The night was dark. Low, flying cloud blotted out the moon. There would be no light, so the horses would travel unseen. They rode to the great black heart of the moor, where there were no tracks and no paths, but Francis Davy found his way like a hawk in the air. They rode in silence. And then, in front of them, barring their further progress, rolled a great bank of fog, a white wall that stifled every scent and sound. Francis Davy turned to Mary. 
he looked like a ghost, with a fog on his lashes and his hair. The gods have gone against me, after all. To continue now amongst the marshes would be worse madness than to return. We must wait for the dawn. There will be rest for you then, Mary Yellen, a cave for your shelter, and granite for your bed. Later, Mary sat with her knees drawn to her chin, her arms clasped tight around them, but even so the raw air found its way between the folds of her cloak and lapped her skin. Sleep would never come to her tonight. But she must have slept. She woke from a dream, feeling his hand upon her mouth. He forced her hands behind her back and bound them with cool and calm deliberation, using his own belt. He stood on the edge of the hill, holding her arm, and commanded her to listen. She must have slept longer than she thought, for the darkness had broken, and morning had come. And far away there came a sound between a cry and a call, like a summons in the air. A slow, grim smile cut into his face like a wound. It was the cry of the squire's bloodhounds. Come. Friend or enemy, we share a common danger now. They scrambled up the hill with his arm about her, climbing ever higher and higher to the great peak of Routor, where on the summit the granite was monstrously shaped, tortured and twisted into the semblance of a roof. Mary could climb no further. The vicar bent down and cut the belt that bound her arms. She clung to a table of stone some ten feet from the ground, panting and exhausted, while he climbed above her and beyond. Mary looked down, and there were little dots of fifty men or more standing knee-deep in the heather, while the yelping hounds ran before them like rats amongst the boulders. Somebody shouted again, and a man kneeling in the heather lifted his gun to his shoulder and fired, and she saw that the man was Jem and he had not seen her. Then Jem fired once more, and, looking beyond her, Mary saw the tall, black figure of Francis Davy outlined against the sky, standing upon a wide slab like an altar, high above her head. He stood for a moment poised like a statue, his hair blowing in the wind, and then he flung out his arms as a bird throws his wings for flight and drooped suddenly and fell down from his granite peak to the wet, dank heather and the little crumbling stones. It was a hard, bright day in early January. Mary was at liberty now to go where she would and her thoughts turned to Helford and the green valleys of the south. She had a queer, sick longing for home in her heart and the sight of warm, familiar faces. As she walked alone on Twelve Men's Moor, she saw a cart coming towards her from Kilmar, making tracks in the white frost like a hare. The horse laboured beneath a strange load of pots and pans and mattresses and sticks. It was only when the driver waved that she recognised him. She went down towards the cart with a fine show of indifference and turned at once to the horse to pat him, while Jem kicked a stone under the wheel and wedged it there for safety. What are you doing with that? I want to get away from the side of Kilmar yonder. Here's my old Mary, all I've ever had of it, here in the cart. If you were a man, I'd ask you to come with me. You'd fling your legs over the seat and stick your hands in your pockets and rub shoulders with me for as long as it pleased you. He took her face in his hands and kissed it. When you're an old maid in mittens down in Halford, you'll remember that. He stole horses, you'll say to yourself, and he didn't care for women, but for my pride, I'd have been with him now. You know it's not pride. There's a sickness in my heart for home and all the things I've lost. He drew the reins into his hands and whistled to the horse. 
Wait. Wait, hold him still. And give me your hand. He reached down to her and swung her beside him on the driver's seat. Where do you want me to take you? You have your back to Halford, you know that? Mary nodded. If you come with me, it'll be a hard life, and a wild one at times. Men are ill companions when the mood takes them. Oh, take the risk, Jem. Enchant your moods. Do you love me, Mary? I believe so, Jem. I'm sitting here because I must. Because now and forevermore, this is where I belong. He laughed then and took her hand and gave her the reins. And she did not look back over her shoulder again, but set her face towards the Tamar. Tamsin Gregg was reading the final episode of Jamaica Inn by Daphne du Maurier, abridged by Loris Morgan Griffiths. It was produced in Bristol by Alison Crawford. After the news, Lionel Blair celebrates the great life of Sammy Davis Jr. But first, here's James Nochte. Did you know that the winner of the Man Booker Prize, Howard Jacobson, was also a teenage table tennis champion in the 50s? He'll be revealing all, or most of all, in the first book club of the new year, talking about the novel that he calls shamelessly autobiographical, The Mighty Waltzer. It follows the travails of the teenage Oliver Waltzer, who, despite his success at ping-pong, finds other areas of life more challenging, working on the market stall run by his father, attempting to seduce the luscious Lorna Peachley. It's a hilarious and poignant tale from a master of confessional humour. Howard Jacobson in Book Club this Sunday at four o'clock.